Now, this person, when was asked to protrude the tongue, the tongue deviated. Now, the tongue has intrinsic muscles and extrinsic muscles. Now, you need to revise your muscular, your muscular system. Which muscle protrudes the tongue? The answer is genioglossus. Two muscles, they take origin from the genial tubercle of the mandible, most anterior part on the inside, and insert on the tongue. And when they work together, the tongue is protruded in the middle. If one of them is not working, the balance is different. Here, the right one is working. The left is not working. Therefore, the tongue deviated towards the affected side. The left side is missing the muscle that puts the tongue in the middle. This is an indication that there's something wrong with hypoglossal nerve. This is the normal position of the tongue. This tongue, or the right side of the tongue, in this patient has been paralyzed for some time. Why? Because it has atrophied. When you cut a nerve supply for muscle, after some time, it gets atrophied. Here's the difference between a normal and paralyzed half of the tongue, because the muscle is atrophied. Here is a young person, when he was asked to put through the tongue, the tongue deviated to the left. That means, the left genioglossus is not working. That means the left hypoglossal nerve is, is not working. Why? And what's happening and where is the story? The story is here. Lower part of the medulla. The olive. And the Rambled system, and here is the nucleus of the hypoglossal. Hypoglossal nerve is a pure motor, and fibers start in this motor nucleus between the olive and the pyramid, and the fibers, as few rootlets, they come out and they enter the hypoglossal canal. And once they are outside the skull, they get into the carotid sheath. The carotid sheath has in its uppermost part several cranial nerves, 9, 10, and 12. Then, the hypoglossal nerve is going to go down, leave the carotid sheath, and hooks around occipital artery, coming from the external carotid artery. This is the point of exit of hypoglossal, the olive nucleus and the pyramidal system. This is the base of the brain, and here is the point of exit of hypoglossal nerve. Now, hypoglossal nerve, as it comes out near the cervical plexus, now, a ventral ramus of C1 is going to join the hypoglossal nerve. It 
runs along with it. Each one has its own sheep. They don't mix. And after a very short time, the C1 is going to supply the strap muscles, muscles of the anterior part of the neck. And this is called descendant hypoglossi. This is descending is all right, but hypoglossus uh, is not correct term. Now C2, they come down, forming the cervical plexus, and this part is called descendants cervicalis, and they hook and they make a loop. This loop is called ansa cervicalis. So nerve supply of the strap muscles of the anterior part of the neck uh, the hypoglossal share nothing for its nerve supply. It's only that C1 travels with it for a short distance. This is another diagram. If you want to look for the hypoglossal nerve, go for angle of the mandible and submandibular salivary gland. And crossing, that's the uh, common carotid, right? This is external carotid, internal carotid, this is external carotid, and this is the hypoglossal nerve. Again, this is a loop of nerve, so this is ansa cervicalis, and the hypoglossal nerve can be like can be seen here very well in this image the hypoglossal nerve comes out of the skull through hypoglossal canal <coughs> into the carotid sheath and then it leaves it crosses the external carotid which is not in the carotid sheath and here it is going towards the submandibular area. Now a closer look is the hypoglossal nerve, is the occipital artery. This is the hypoglossal nerve, this is the external carotid. And this is the facial nerve, sorry, facial artery, tortuous. And the nerve is going into the submandibular area under cover of mylohyoid. Deep to it is the hyoglossus. This is the hyoglossus, this is the mylohyoid. This is the mylohyoid muscle, the floor of the mouth. Where are we? This is the submandibular salivary gland. This is the common carotid artery, bifurcates into internal and external. And the nerve crossing, yeah, I a tricky telephone. Therapy had a nerve, you know? Hmm, therapy? Hypoglossal nerve. That's the submandibular salivary gland. Here is the submandibular area. This is representing skin. And this area contains many lymph nodes. Sometimes you need to take a lymph node or two if you make haphazard incision without knowing where is the nerve and you do this incision for example you end up cutting the hypoglossal nerve paralyzing half of the tongue here is the mandible ok 
okay, and here is the carotid, common carotid artery, and here is a nerve crossing the beginning of external and internal carotid artery. Therefore, this is the hypoglossal nerve. The hypoglossal nerve gets into the mouth and enters the tongue and supplies the extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue. Again, another landmark is a nerve crossing the two carotid arteries. This is the ansa cervicalis. And this is the hypoglossal nerve. This is the descending part and this is the other part. So this is the story of the hypoglossal nerve. talking about the brachial plexus. Now, nerves going down the upper limb, they should be designed in a way to cope with so many muscles in the upper limb. And spinal nerves, especially the ventral rami, uh, they are going to be five, but the simple arrangement of five is not good enough to supply all muscles. So, so they need to be mixed and shuffled. Now, who would accept that his child will be like this? This is damaged brachial plexus on both sides. How is this baby going to to live his life or her life. What is the <coughs> condition of the family having such a baby? Now, if the doctor doesn't know what is the breaker plexus and what is the importance of the breaker plexus uh, and he makes a mistake, this is the, the result. So. Don't be the reason why this baby is having this condition. Spend more time and manage more time with, when you treat your patients. This is a, a newly born baby and you can see that the right arm is, is kicking and normal, but the left arm is lying idle. No movement. Why is this? It's because an ignorant doctor trying to assist delivery of the head starts to wrongly manipulate the head. Meaning that increase the angle between the head and shoulder on both sides. So this is the very delicate, very small, thread-like brachial plexus. If you manipulate it, then you increase the angle and it is torn. The result is the image you have just seen. Here's also a newly born baby with damaged brachial plexus. Now in this adult person, if you compare the, the deltoid of this side with the deltoid of this side, this has atrophied arm muscles here are normal, arm muscles nearly gone, <clears throat> muscles of the forearm as well. So there's a problem with the brachial plexus here. <clears throat> Where is the problem? Now, as, as a doctor, I have to describe what I see. 
I know that the rounding of the shoulders is due to the deltoid. Okay? Now here, I have well-rounded shoulder here. It's not. Then I know that there is a scapula here. This inferior angle is a spine here, supraspinatus muscle, infraspinatus muscle, teres major and minor, right? So this looks normal. On this side, deltoid gone into atrophy, the infraspinatus, the teres major and minor, uh, they have all atrophied. <coughs> Okay, as well as the, you can see that the muscles in the arm are, they look healthy here and they look thinner here. So that is a lesion of the brachial plexus. This person has what's called winging of the scapula. The scapula like on this normal side, should be stuck to the posterior chest wall. Here, the scapula is winged, just like having a wing. The muscle that, that does that is the serratus anterior. Serratus anterior muscle, it's called the boxer muscle because it pushes the arm forward. Now, when do I use this movement? I use this movement when I take my keys and try to open the door. Okay. Now, if the serratus anterior is not working and there's a winging of the scapula, I cannot do this. So what do I do? I do this. Okay. So this is also a problem of one of the branches of the brachial plexus. Here is the deltoid atrophy compared to this one. More severe atrophy. You can even see the features of the upper end of, of the humerus. This person, his hand is always in this position. Always, the little and little fingers are always flexed. The nerve to the muscles producing flexion Sufia Fuad Sufia Anamayestil Wujuf They are paralyzed. When time goes on, the paralyzed muscle will have more fibrous tissue and they get what's called contracture. They get shorter. So this is an old problem of the ulnar nerve. If you look at the hands of this old person. Now, on the left hand, things look different from the right. There is at, on the right, there is atrophy of the thinner muscle. The question is, what is the nerve supply of the thinner muscle? It is a major branch of brachial plexus. So there are so many reasons why we should know the brachial plexus. This person cannot extend the wrist. Now the posterior compartment of the forearm contains extensor muscles. They extend the wrist and fingers. Now the grip in this person is very weak. Now, for good grip, you need to extend the wrist. So it's called wrist drop. 
This young happy person, if you compare the right and the left side, he is a good Pakras major, he is not good Pakras major. Is a good deltoid, not good deltoid. Healthy, bulky muscles of the arm, thin, there is hardly any muscle. This is a problem of brachial plexus. Now, to live a happy life and sing in the bath, you need brachial plexus. So what's going on in these patients? And what is their story? What's happening in the brachial plexus? A plexus means a network, maybe of nerves or blood vessels or veins. The starting point is here. Dorsal side of the spinal cord, rootlets. They are sensory. Then root, dorsal root. The dorsal root has a ganglion where the cell body of the sensory pathway is present. Ventrally coming out of the spinal cord, motor, rootlets, and then ventral ramus. And the dorsal and ventral rami, they join and they form spinal nerve. Spinal nerve is very fort. Meet almost immediately divides into dorsal ramus and a ventral ramus. The dorsal ramus will go to the muscles at the back, and the muscles at the back, first of all, they are not skillful and there aren't many of them and they don't do lots of movements while the muscles in front of the body are simply the opposite. Again, dorsal root, dorsal root ganglion, ventral root motor, spinal nerve is short, the dorsal ramus going to the back of the body, but the ventral ramus of the spinal nerve comes anteriorly and these ventral rami create plexuses. Rearrangement, rearrangement so that they reach the target muscles in a correct way. Spinal nerve is present in the intervertebral foramen, made of a notch in the superior vertebra, a notch in the inferior vertebra, plus the disc. This is where you find spinal nerve. This is an MRI of intervertebral foramen. And again, this is showing the spinal nerve. Now, protrusion of the disc, if it ruptures, is going to press on the nerve and the result is, is pain. And MRI of different stages of the brachial plexus. And here is a problem in the brachial plexus. So let's see a thumb. About the brachial plexus. Brachial plexus anatomy is a very difficult task. And we can to make it easy for all of us. People use rather thermal grids called beer. These mnemonics are rubbish. Don't memorize them. Cold in the cold and beer in the branches. The brachial 
plexus is like a tree that got roots, trunks, and divisions. We start with the basics. You got roots, five roots. It starts from C5 to T1. So it's C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. The roots lie the interval between the scalenus anterior and the scalenus medius. After the roots, you find the trunks. The upper trunk, the middle trunk, and the lower trunk. Three trunks. You pass through the posterior triangle of the neck. So five roots, you give you three trunks. Each of the three trunks divide into anterior and posterior division. This division pass behind the clavicle. So three trunks will give you six divisions. Five roots, three trunks, six divisions. Some of these divisions join to give you curves. The posterior curve, the lateral curve, and the medial curve. These curves are in the axilla. Let's see a, a diagram just just to build a preliminary idea about the brachial plexus. Ventral rami of spinal nerves. It is not spinal nerves. It is the ventral rami of spinal nerves. Five of them. The spinal nerves, as they come out, they form trunks, upper, middle, and lower. Three of trunks. They are above the clavicle. Trunks will give us divisions, and three anterior and three posterior, six of them. They are behind the clavicle. Divisions will form cords. Lateral, posterior, and medial. Two what? Two auxiliary arteries. Three cords. Behind the pectoralis minor. And then the major nerves of the brachial plexus are in axilla. They are axillary, musculocutaneous, radial, median, and ulnar. We will be talking about them when we talk about nerves of the upper limb. This is an image of the overall brachial plexus. Different stages, small branches, and terminal branches. This is 
group of ventral rami. This is the ventral rami of cervical plexus. And these are the ventral rami of brachial plexus. The roots of the brachial plexus are C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. This is C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. These are the roots. Now, the roots as they come out of the vertebral column area, we are going to look for them in this area, which is called the supraclavicular triangle, which is part of the posterior triangle. And this is the scalenus anterior, and this is the scalenus medius, and this is first rib, this is subclavian artery. Once it crosses the first rib, it becomes the axillary artery. Anterior to the scalenus anterior is subclavian vein. And here is the roots or the ventral rami of the brachial plexus. Scanus anterior, scanus medius, in between them are the roots of the brachial plexus. Sometimes one, of, one or two or three of the roots of the brachial plexus, they pass inside the scanus anterior. And when these muscles contract, they produce problems motor or sensory in the upper limb. Here is a view of, a superior view of what is called the thoracic inlet. And this area here is the apex of the lung covered by a fibrous membrane called copula. Now one of the tumors of the lung is tumor of the apex called pancos tumor. Now, the brachial plexus sits on the tip, the apex of the lung. It can be affected by this tumor. If you look at the roots, roots form trunk. This is C5, and this is C6. They join and form superior trunk. C7 doesn't like to join anything. Continues as the middle trunk. C8 joins T1 and forms the inferior <coughs> trunk. When we just separate things, which muscle is this? In which the phrenic nerve is passing obliquely. In front of it, this is the scalenus anterior is the subclavian artery. So this is the trunk, superior, middle, inferior. The sound of happy people. It's good. Each trunk is going to divide into 
anterior and posterior division. That's the posterior division. That's the anterior division of the superior trunk. That's the posterior division of the middle trunk, and this is the anterior division of the middle trunk. That's the posterior of the inferior trunk, and this is the anterior of the inferior trunk. So we have three red and three blue, six divisions. Now, the upper two anterior divisions, okay, will form a cord, okay, lateral cord. The three posterior divisions will form posterior cord. And the single inferior cord is going to, to the single inferior division will form the medial cord. Superior and middle and inferior, <coughs> sorry, medial, lateral, and posterior cords are what? Medial to what? Posterior to what? The answer is to the axillary artery. So they are around the axillary artery. This is the medial cord, this is the posterior cord, and this is the lateral cord. This is the posterior cord. And this is the formation of the posterior cord. This is the lateral cord, which is going to divide into two branches. This is the medial cord, which is going also to divide into two branches. These branches are in the axilla, and they are the origin of the terminal branches, which we will be talking about in the next lecture. Cords are under cover of pectoralis minor. Now, we have minor branches coming out of the brachial plexus in different stages. This is C5 giving this nerve, which is called dorsal scapular nerve. Okay. This is the long thoracic nerve going for serratus anterior, and we have seen this thoracic, long thoracic nerve coming from C5, C6, C7. They come from the ventral rami. Then there is this nerve, which is suprascapular, because the scapula is, is just posterior to this area comes out of the upper trunk <coughs> and this is the suprascapular nerve. You know, there's a muscle here called what? Infraspinatus and there's a muscle here called supraspinatus. This is the axillary later on. There is a nerve that comes the subscapular nerve. You know the subscapularis muscle is on the anterior surface of the scapula attached to the posterior thoracic wall and it's a very big muscle, very thick muscle. And it has two nerves supplying it. This is the upper subscapular 
scapular nerve. It's a branch of posterior cord. Of course, the posterior cord. If it is posterior to the brachial plexus and you have a posterior cord, then the nerve supply is going to be from the posterior cord. There's this nerve also going to the subscapularis, and this is the lower subscapular nerve. It's also a branch of posterior cord. There is this nerve coming from also the posterior cord. It's called thoracodorsal nerve. This nerve is going to the latissimus dorsi and the rhomboid. This nerve is coming from the lateral cord going to the pectoralis minor. Lateral pectoral nerve. From the medial cord going to pectoralis major and it is medial pectoral nerve. This nerve is coming from where? From what I see in this image, it's coming from intercostal nerve. It's not coming from the brachial plexus. It's coming from intercostal nerve and it is going to join terminal branches of the brachial plexus. And this is called intercostal brachial nerve. Rightly named. The posterior cord is going to end as radial nerve. Radial nerve is a nerve for extension in the arm and in the forearm. Okay. Also from the posterior cord you get the axillary. The axillary is also for extension. It supplies deltoid. Then we have this nerve which has two roots from the lateral cord and from the medial cord. It's called the median nerve. The median nerve is the nerve of flexion. Okay, flexion of the fingers. This nerve is coming from the lateral cord and it is entering this muscle. It's called the muscle, uh, the coracobrachialis. From the coracoid process to the humerus, it goes through the muscle and supplies muscles of the anterior compartment of the arm. This is the ulnar nerve, continuation of the medial trunk, sorry, the medial cord, and the musculocutaneous median and ulnar they make an M arrangement. Now, we use this M arrangement to identify the terminal branches and we can identify structures going back. Musculocutaneous, median and ulnar. Summary. Roots, C5, C6, C7 runs on its own, C8 and T1, they join. Trunks, superior trunk, middle trunk, and inferior trunk. 
anterior division, another anterior division, and the third anterior division. Posterior division, another posterior division, and three posterior divisions make posterior cord. These two anterior divisions, okay, they are going to share in the formation of the median nerve. Okay, and this is the ulnar nerve. And the three posterior will form the radian nerve. Thank you.